Welcome. In this video, I wanted to give a little more discussion on heat. So what we've done so far is to quantify heat. And specifically, we were able to establish a relationship that connects heat with a change in temperature. And we concluded, uh, based on both our experience and um, what the universe uh, experimentation uh, gives us, that is, whenever you increase heat, that's going to change your temperature, and it's going to increase it. Uh, and we knew that, that the change, the increase in heat, causes a, um, uh, a corresponding change in, in an increase in temperature. Obviously, the amount by which the temperature changes will depend on the mass of the object which is receiving the heat supplied or even heat extracted. And that also, that object will determine how well that heat is um, uh, utilized to change the temperature. That's the specific heat capacity. The larger the specific heat capacity, the less likely, the more energy you need to change the temperature of an object. Okay, so this was the equation we ended up with. That's a heat equation. That's the heat supplied or extracted, the mass of the object uh, on which heat is supplied or from which heat is extracted. And this is the specific, specific heat capacity, which is the property of the object. And this is the temperature the object will undergo when such amount of heat is supplied. And we said that this equation was applicable provided that the change in temperature, the range of the change in temperature, doesn't include a, uh, a, a, um, a phase transition point. Because whenever phase transition occurs, we know that temperature doesn't change. Any heat supplied when an object is at its phase transition is not spent to increase the temperature, but rather it's spent to change phase. Another way of saying that is, at the point, at the uh, cusp of phase transition, any heat supplied will no longer increase the kinetic energy of the molecular mole molecules of the object, but rather it will be spent to uh, sever the bonds or the structure of a solid um, if the object is a solid. Okay. And in that case, when we're dealing with phase transition, the appropriate equation to use is this one. Here we have the heat of fusion, um, which is the amount of energy that one needs to supply in order to effect a phase transition. If the phase transition is from a solid to a, a liquid or from a liquid to a solid, the heat involved is called fusion. So that's what the uh, subscript F stands for, that's fusion. And if we're transforming the object from uh, a, a solid, sorry, from a liquid to a gas, the type of heat we're involved with is the heat, latent heat of vaporization. And again, this is something we determine experimentally, and we do have uh, records of it from data, point, data tables. So we can always look this up for objects um, we're working with. And M here would be the mass of the object that's undergoing the phase transition. Okay, so that's a brief summary of what we've done so far. However, we hadn't spoken about the way we supply heat. We were just concerned about the amount of heat supplied and how much temperature change it affects. Uh, and how much heat is required in order to transform, to change phase. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about where this heat is coming from. Well, typically there are two sources. One, and I've categorized them here in two ways. The first one is an infinite source. Although this is not quite true, it's more theoretical. Sometimes we call it a heat bath. Um, but... It, it's helpful for theoretical understanding of, object, of, of problems, but typically we don't have this a true infinite source of energy or of heat in, in, the real, in the real universe. But we can have things that are approximately infinite sources. For instance, uh, when you put a, a few ice blocks on your table, 
uh, in your room, well, eventually they melt, which means they have absorbed energy or heat from the surrounding atmosphere. But obviously that amount of heat absorbed will not change the, ch the room temperature. It's that in a global scale, you will not affect the, temp the room temperature by just a few ice blocks absorbing heat. So essentially, in that situation, the atmosphere would be acting as though it were an infinite source, a source that is not affected. It doesn't lose its temperature. It doesn't change its temperature when it transfers heat into another object. So, so although this is primarily theoretical, we do have real-life situations which are approximately this. So don't discard this as being something for the theoreticians. Actually, it's useful in both understanding the problems and approximating real-life situations. What we're more familiar with, especially in our day-to-day -day experience, is that the supply of heat typically comes from a finite source. Um, for instance, you put a cup of uh, put coffee in a cup. Uh, you might eventually realize that your coffee, the liquid, is going to cool down because of the cup um, uh, absorbing heat from from the coffee, the liquid inside. And this this is a finite source. That's because the coffee, the liquid, the coffee itself has a has a finite amount of heat. So whenever it, heat is heat uh, energy is transferred from it, it will change its temperature. Unlike the infinite source, which wouldn't change its temperature, it would, um, in an, um, it will continually supply heat without being affected. Okay, so let's consider a very practical example of finite sources. This is actually quite useful. Um, especially in the context of x-ray uh, generators, it's quite useful. So consider two objects, object A and B. Object A is here blue, signifying that its temperature is less than object B, which is in red, which signifies it's hot, hotter than object A. Now what we do know, based on our discussion of how heat affects temperature and how temperature affects heat, we know that because the temperature of object B is larger than that of object A, there's going to be a heat flow. And the direction of heat flow will be from object B to object A. This is the principle we observe in nature. It's always the hotter object transfers energy to the cooler object. It's never the other way around very interesting uh, process, thermodynamical process, which uh, never reverses. So, because heat is flowing from object B, what we do know is that the temperature of object B is going to decrease. So, as object B loses energy, transfers heat to object A, it would lose some energy and therefore cause its temperature to change. Hence, uh, effect specifically, decrease. But object A is receiving energy from object B, so the amount of energy is going to increase. It's going to gain energy, and therefore its temperature will also increase. But if we leave this object, uh, this, pro uh, this system, for long enough, eventually the temperature of object B will be equal to that of temperature, uh, the temperature of object A. Eventually, they will reach the same temperature, at which point we will, we will have arrived at this point called thermal equilibrium. And remember that thermal equilibrium signifies that there's no more net heat transfer. Heat transfer ceases at thermal equilibrium. And what we know is that because these objects have the same temperature, there will be no more heat transfer Hence, the two objects will have the same temperature. So the final temperature of object B will be the same as temp the final temperature of object A. Let's call this temperature T sub F, uppercase F. Typically, the temperature, the final temperature Tf, 
is smaller than that of the initially hot object, but larger than that of the initially cooler object, which in this case would mean that Tf will be smaller than the initial temperature of object B, but larger than the temperature of object A. And this inequality is true provided that we don't have any phase transition. If there were phase transition, then things might, we might need to maybe put a, an, uh, an equality here, but that's beyond our, our um, situation. One thing I forgot to mention uh, is that this system here, of system made up of object A and B, is actually isolated. This is very important in this case. This system is isolated, which means its thermodynamic, thermodynamics is limited to these two objects. It doesn't interact with the outside universe. Because of the isolation, we know that the energy has to be conserved. Whatever amount of energy that object B lost must have gone to object A because, remember, the system doesn't interact with the outside world. So if this as gay has lost 7 joules, that means this guy must have gained 7 joules. It is not possible to lose energy and not be able to account for it. That's the principle of the conservation of energy. If we were to write this down mathematically, this means the amount of energy or the, the heat um, gained by object A plus the amount of heat or energy lost by object B, the sum of these two had better be equal to zero. In other words, the loss had better be equal to the gain. Otherwise, there would be energy f uh, fraud, and the universe doesn't allow that. This is a principle of nature. Uh, there is a possible misconception uh, I've observed previously. People have thought that the change in temperature is what's conserved. Actually, there is no law of nature which guarantees this. Suppose the change in temperature for object B, suppose it, it changes its temperature by 4 degrees Celsius. It is not necessarily true that object A will increase its temperature by 4 degrees Celsius. In other words, the changes in temperatures need not add up to zero. There's no law of the conservation of temperature. Okay, but we do have this law of the conservation of energy. Actually, let's look at an example which will, which will help us out. The first one is we have a coffee cup. Um, I've made, made this example up. So we have a coffee cup, uh, or rather uh, a glass cup, if you like. This cup is initially uh, at 24 degrees Celsius. Its mass is 50 uh, grams. Because it's made out of glass, it's, uh, it's the, the specific heat capacity of the glass is 840 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Now, into this cup, we introduce a certain amount of coffee, specifically 245 grams of it. And the coffee is at a temperature, initial temperature of 96 degrees Celsius. Now, because this system is isolated, although in this particular case I didn't draw the box, but by specifying that this is an isolated system, we know that something specific holds. That is, any losses in energy from the coffee uh, must equal to the gains on the cup. In other words, whatever amount of heat the coffee liquid loses, the cup will, must gain. The energy has to go somewhere. If it's lost to the coffee, it will be gained to the cup. Therefore, we can write down that the energy from the cup, or sorry, gained by the cup, plus the energy lost by the coffee, this should be equal to zero. But how much energy um, comes from the cup? Oh, sorry, how much energy does the cup gain? Well, the amount of energy is going to be equal to the mass of the cup times the specific heat capacity of the cup. Uh, I do realize I'm changing between cup and glass.
cup and glass are going to mean the same thing for me now. Or maybe for clarity, let me just say G for glass. Let's say G, the mass of the glass and the change in temperature for the glass, plus the mass of the coffee. And I'm going to use CF for coffee, just for a bit of brevity to keep the video short. Uh, CF uh, and the specific heat capacity of the coffee which coffee is essentially water so its specific, its specific heat capacity will be similar to that of water because coffee granules don't change the specific heat capacity of water much okay and then the change in temperature for the coffee we know, because this is an isolated system, it must be true that these energies, energy for the cup and the energy for the coffee, must be equal to zero. What is it that we're looking for? We are interested in finding the final temperature at which these two are going to be in thermal equilibrium. In other words, where the coffee inside the cup and the cup itself assume the same temperature. Because the cup is initially hotter than the, uh, sorry, because the coffee is initially hotter than the cup, we know there's going to be a transfer of heat from the coffee to the cup. That transfer will occur until the temperatures are the same, at which point we will have arrived at thermal equilibrium and no more heat transfer will continue. So let's find what that temperature, that final temperature is. Because we know that final temperature is going to be common to the cup and to the coffee, we can do something interesting here. We can unpack this equation and say this is mg, cg, and we're going to open bracket and say T final of the glass minus the initial of the glass was 24, so we can say 24 here. Close bracket plus, now over to the coffee, this is the mass of the coffee uh, times the specific heat capacity, and then open bracket for the temperature, change in temperature. Then this is going to be T final for the coffee minus the T initial for the coffee, which was 96. This is going to be equal to zero. Now, remember, it's very important to remember that we are looking for the temperature where they will have well, uh, uh, the temperature at which thermal equilibrium will, will be reached, which means T final of the glass is going to be T final of the coffee. In other words, these two things here are actually the same number. Uh, they are the same quantity. So if you like, we can even just call it T uppercase F and substitute it in here. Oops, that was, uh, we can substitute it in here and just say that's Tf. And in this equation, if we were to solve for Tf, we would find what the final temperature at which these two are going to thermalize is. I will leave the solution to this, the numerical solution to you, as your exercise. Please post your answer on the comments so that I'll be able to figure out whether you you're, you you manage to understand you, you're able to understand this or not okay and uh, for in another way of approaching this problem or another way of utilizing this idea of an isolated system and finite sources of heat is where you are given a scenario but the system is unspecified Sometimes we're not told whether a system is isolated or not, but we could use our understanding of thermodynamics to determine whether the system is isolated or not. For instance, consider a similar example as we just did, where we're not told whether the system is, is isolated or not, so it's left unspecified. However, they do provide us with a final temperature. Now, the question they, possibly ask, they could possibly ask is, is the system isolated? Well, remember what isolation of a system means. It means that the objects, the two parties that are uh, playing, the members of the system, can only transfer energy between the two. 
In our case, the two members are the coffee and the glass or the cup. So, we, if the two are in uh, are in isolated system, let's say Q for the uh, glass, which I'm going to call G, plus the Q for the coffee. If this is true, if the energies between the two, the sum of their energies is equal to zero joules, then we could claim that the system is isolated. Is isolated. However, suppose we were to calculate the heat uh, or the energy gained by the coffee glass, or sorry, by the glass and add it to the energy lost by the coffee, and we find that they do not amount to zero, what we would have to conclude is that, well, energy must have been lost, well, energy has been lost to something other than the glass cup, so that means the system is not isolated. Suppose we were to find that it's not zero joules, then we would conclude that the system is not isolated. Actually, I would also uh, commend you try this out, all, uh, this, op this uh, problem. Give it a try. Uh, maybe let me give you a little bit more uh, idea on how to approach it. We know that the final temperature of the system is going to be 42, which means the glass cup is going to be at 42 degrees. So we can calculate how much energy it has gained in going from 24 to 42. We can actually calculate this Qg. And we know also the initial temperature of the coffee and its final. So we can calculate the amount of energy it has lost in going from 96 degrees to 42 degrees Celsius. And then we can perform this calculation and determine which of the two is it... Uh, is our finding corresponding to option A or option B? Actually, post this also. Uh, post them as solutions for answers for example 1 and example 2. And uh, any questions can also be posted on the comments. I will stop here and we'll see you on the next one.